You're listening to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. What is up? Welcome along to my podcast, Straight to Video. As always, I'm your host, Rob Lane, and today I speak to singer, songwriter, and burlesque performer, Ariana Savalis. Yes, you did hear the name correct, and you are right. Ariana is the daughter of Hollywood icon, the late, great Telly Savalis. So during our talk, it was great to hear her memories of her dad whilst growing up in Hollywood, and then later in her life, really diving in and learning about his legacy and fame. We chat about so much stuff in this episode from her new album, which has been produced by Steve Power, who worked on all the early and hugely successful Robbie Williams records, which then sends us down a little Robbie Williams wormhole before bringing things back on track to chat about Ariana's childhood, her time at school, coming to London to study, and then her ever-eventful and ever-changing career from acting, performing, and eventually combining songwriting and her talent for burlesque. Ariana is also a member of the musical entourage known as Postmodern Jukebox, or PMJ as they're often known. PMJ have been around since 2011 and take modern pop songs and rework them into a vintage genre such as swing and jazz. Their initial basement YouTube videos continue to go viral throughout the world and the band are now an international touring act because of that success. Before we talk to Ariana, please be sure to visit our friends Dead Skull Coffee to pick up some amazing ground or full beam rock and roll coffee. If you order through their website, deadskullcoffee.co.uk and add the promo code STV on checkout, you will get yourself 15% off your order. Okay, Ariana has an amazing new single and video out right now called What Do You Want to Know from her upcoming album and all info and links can be found over at arianasavalis.com. But right now, please enjoy my straight-to-video talk with the wonderful Ariana Savalis. I don't want to think. I don't want to be. Just want to sit down on the couch and watch TV. I don't want to talk about this now. What is there to say between us anyhow? What do you want to know? How I'm 34, can't get my shit together Friends are moving on, I'm stuck in stone What do you want to know? How I'm old enough to be somebody's mother Still I'm terrified, these wings are too broken to fly I want to try and chat as much about your career as we have time for, but there's so many parts to your journey. See how we get on. But right now you're getting set to release your new album, Renaissance. How long has that been in the works? Oh my God. It's so funny. I literally just had to write my team and go, Hey guys, remember last week when I told you that the title of the album is Renaissance? Fuck that. Because Beyonce just this fucking morning (laughs) released an announcement that her new album is called Renaissance. And I was like, let's, do ourselves a favor and not try to compete with the queen bee. So now, as of 9.30 this morning, I'm workshopping some new titles for the album. Welcome to being an indie artist in 2022. Kill me. But I'm very happy for her. If, if anybody deserves to, to steal my album title, it's, it's Beyonce. So, you know, couldn't have gone to a better person. But now I have to come up with a new name for, for my record so that people aren't going, why did you steal Beyonce's record title? We haven't actually finalized the album release date yet. My single drops tomorrow. So uh, the first single off of the now untitled record drops tomorrow. And we're, I think, finalizing the record release date. It'll be this year for sure. We just don't know the exact date yet, but but you'll be the first to know. Cool. And you work with Steve Power, who produced... All the early massive Robbie Williams albums, he's worked with bands like Buster, who I'm a massive fan of, Baby Birds, You're Gorgeous, which was a huge single over here. All these massive pop rock songs. How did the two of you hook up? Oh my God, you're going to die laughing. So Steve and I, I'm going to age myself massively. Um, Steve and I met on MySpace. (laughs) And we met like because of my pathological obsession with Robbie Williams. Like I'm a very, very good fan, a very like I'm an obsessed fan of very few artists. I don't have the mental capacity for a lot of music, but the music that I do listen to, I'll know every lyric, every line, every guitar riff, every bass. If I hear an alternate version and there's just one drum snare, that's all, like I'll know. Um, so Robbie Williams is one of those artists. Started listening to him when I was 14 and a friend of mine who was German, cause he wasn't famous in America. Nobody knew who he was in America. I still, still kind of, I mean, 
he did an amazing residency. I went to go see him in Vegas. But, you know, when I ask people if they know Robbie Williams, usually their answer is like, Robin Williams? No, you idiots. Robbie Williams, he's broken world records, you morons. But he never really caught on as crazy as he did in America. So when I was in Europe, when I was a kid, a friend of mine who was Austrian handed me five of his records. She said, I just think you're going to love him. And love was an understatement. I mean, A, I thought we were going to get married because I was 14. And, you know, it was between him and Ricky Martin. And then Ricky Martin turned out to be gay and Robbie Williams did not love me, which is very sad. But his music, I'd say, aside from maybe George Michael, was probably the number one inspiration for me wanting to be a songwriter and a singer. I used to call into the radio. I was such an asshole. I used to call in when I was 15. I used to call into the radio stations in America. They'd be playing Jessica Simpson's version of Angels because she covered it. Do you remember that when she covered Angels? I don't remember Jessica Simpson's version, probably because the Robbie Williams one was so huge over here. Oh, my God, exactly. Well, the UK probably never played her version because it's blasphemy. Like, she's really talented. She's got a beautiful voice. But I was so obsessed with Robbie Williams that I would call in and be like, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. You should be playing the original version, you morons. And they're just like, who the hell is this kid? They're like, I'm sorry, man. Like, you know, everyone wants to hear Jessica Simpson. She's hot. I was like, oh, this is ridiculous. So so I, when I, you know, when I first started songwriting, this is how I got to Steve Power. You know, when I first started singing and first started songwriting, I knew nobody. I didn't have any connections. I didn't know anybody in the music business. I was just like, well, I guess it couldn't hurt to maybe reach out to some So I literally just looked in Robbie Williams's records and I saw who his producers were, right? So it was Guy Chambers and, and Steve, right? At the time, like he was producing and, you know, working on a lot of his records. So I found Steve on MySpace like 10 years ago. I found him on MySpace. I was like, I didn't have a demo. I didn't have anything. I had like maybe three live tracks of me singing some Sinatra shit or something. It was insane. So I just wrote it and I was like, hey, you're going to think I'm insane, but I'm really a big fan of you. And I really love your stuff. And I'm obsessed with your stuff with Robbie Williams. And I just wanted to say, hi, you know, I'd really like to work with you someday. And it started the beginning of one of the most beautiful friendships I've ever had. Steve is now one of my best friends in the world. I cherish his friendship. We actually never worked together. We became friends over MySpace. We talked to his wife, this, that. Like, you know, we just became like pals, music pals, because we had so many, so much in common. And then long story short, you know, a decade later, I write this song. When I hear it, I heard Steve's production in my head. And I was like, dude you have to produce this track. Like you must, there's nobody else. You, you need to be the one. And thankfully he agreed and we worked on it completely remotely. He did everything in London because it was during COVID. From Robbie Williams' obsession to, to writing him on MySpace. That's how our beautiful friendship started and then how he worked on this record. I love that. That's just the best way to do it. Like, who did this? And finding the name in the credits to the album, it's just the coolest. It's unreal that it actually worked. <laughs> like, I mean, the fact that I got such an amazing friend out of it, that was a humongous surprise. Because I really was just like, I know nobody. Let's just start with the people I'm obsessed with and work our way down from there. Well, surely Robbie Williams is pretty much a neighbor to you. He's got houses out on the West Coast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I live like the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon at all times. Like really good friend of mine who was the videographer for my band also just worked on cutting the vocals for Robbie. And so I'm trying not to be a freak about it and like ask him shit. Like I'm trying to be cool. And so I need to like keep my shit together and like not fangirl out really hard and try to pretend like I feel like I belong here. I'm almost this close to meeting him. He was doing a private event with my band and I couldn't go because I was on tour in Europe. My band leader texted me and he's like, dude, guess who's here? And I was like, no, why God? <laughs> It'll happen one day. Definitely, definitely. I want to learn a little as to what brings us to today and some of the other things you've done. You were born in Los Angeles. Obviously, the surname Savalas is legendary and unmistakable for your dad's work in TV and movies. I couldn't talk to you without showing you this, which is sat in my bedroom. Oh, my God. That's amazing. I have that same one. Oh, my God. You should describe what that is because we're, we're not on, on video. You should tell people because that's brilliant. I got my Kojak Buick, which I think my dad probably bought for me when I was like, Far too young to understand it. I think he must have just been a massive Kojak fan. And I've had it since I was a kid. You're such a child, though. We're like the same age. How do you even know Kojak? I'm older than you. I'm much older than you. I'm 35. How old are you? I'm 47. What? How dare you? 
That's offensive. How rude. 1974. Oh my God. Well, you know, my tailor, I went to him to, to get some stuff tailored and uh, he's a sweet, can't pinpoint his accent, very adorable little man. And he was pinning all my stuff and he goes, you know, I started this shop when you were just a baby. You were one years old. And I'm like, Oh, that's so fun. When did you when did you start the shop? 1975. I'm like, oh, fuck you. I'm like, well, I'm never wearing this hairstyle again. <laughs> Am I right? You all lived in a hotel because your dad didn't like the usual home house situation. Yeah, he hated houses. He loved to be around people. He lived at the Sheraton Universal in North Hollywood. Uh, it was kind of the ongoing joke in LA that if you wanted to see a celebrity, all you had to do is just kind of like wait in the Sheraton lobby for like a minute, you know, like maybe a few hours. And eventually Telly Savalas would come strolling in and go grab a drink at the bar. It was really wild. I mean, our aunts and uncles were the bartenders and waitresses and front desk people. I actually just went like about seven years ago. I'm a very straight-laced person, despite looking potentially not like that. People see my burlesque shows and they, they think I have a much more vibrant life than I do. But I don't really drink, smoke, do drugs, I don't do any of that shit. But my friend definitely does. And her mother called me and she said she can't get a hold of her and she's really scared that she's like not conscious or whatever because she can't, she's not answering her phone. She's staying at the Sheraton Universal. So I hadn't been back to the Sheraton for 25 years, right? They knew me when I was a baby, right? So I'm like, fuck, I gotta go back. And hopefully I'm like, nobody's gonna actually still be there from when I was a kid. Lo and behold, the Bellmen from 20 years ago were still there. Ellie was there from 20 years ago. It was insane. And he was like, Ariana, oh my God, I can't believe it. My little Ariana, like, you know, pinching my cheeks. And like, he knew me when I was a baby, like I grew up there. And I'm like, so I have a favor to ask you. My friend may or may not be high in one of your hotel rooms and I need to go save her. And he's like thinking to himself, I'm sure, well, you grew up real nice. <laughs> like, what a nice young lady you turned out to be. So I go upstairs with Ellie. He lets me up and knock on her door. She answers the door completely naked. Like when I say naked, I mean like no underwear, full nudity. And Ellie's like, what the fuck is going on? So I run, and she's like, sweetie, how are you doing? Oh my goodness. And she's like literally falling over. So I'm like grabbing her, throwing her in a robe and I throw her in my car and she ends up puking in the rest of my car. And that was my introduction back to the Sheraton. So yeah, you know, fond memories when I was a kid. Did the hotel seem smaller than you remembered because you'd grown up? Yeah, for sure. It's weird because they change things. Just like if you go to an old house of yours, right? That new people will have different furniture. It's the same bones, but different remodeling and stuff. So you walk into like what used to be the kind of banquet hall and now it's like a sports center or something. You're like, oh shit, it's so weird. Yeah, it's really cool though. It's fun to go back. Because didn't your dad have a bar in there? Is that still there named after him? Kelly Sports Bar. No, sadly they shut that down. I think a few years after he passed. Bastards. But yeah, no, he, he had a bar there, I, I think, for for like a good decade or so. It wasn't until I think you're in your 20s when you really began to look back into your dad's legacy and impact on film, TV and pop culture. What was it like suddenly having all this amazing footage to absorb and learn about? Was it cool? Like, holy crap, the stuff he did, this is amazing. You know, when you're a kid, you really don't get what a celebrity is and you don't really understand fame at all. So, you know, and he died when I was seven. So, you know, I didn't really know him as anything but a dad. And I didn't really think anything was out of the ordinary that, you know, we were at these crazy places and living in a hotel and, you know, getting the chicken pox in the Sheraton Universal. You know, that all just seemed quite normal. You know, when I grew up, because, you know, it was a bit painful to look at things, you know, when you're a teenager and I don't know, my, my coping mechanism was to just kind of shut everything out in, in a way. I didn't, I didn't really like to look at old clips of my dad. I didn't, you know, it just made me sad. All my friends, their dads and they're going to father daughter dances and I'm not and kind of feeling sorry for myself, you know, but then I kind of grew up and probably at the advent of YouTube, because I'm ancient. So I remember when there wasn't YouTube. So when YouTube started coming out and people started posting all these videos of, of my dad, you know, and I just kind of went to a deep dive. I knew he was famous, obviously. You see his, you know, his People's Choice Awards in our house and stuff. Like I knew he was a famous guy, but then I go online and, you know, at the time when I first got into music, my obsessions were A, Robbie Williams, but then from my dad's era, like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Tony Bennett and all of these like, just kind of brilliant, legendary kind of jazz 
standards performers. I was I was really heavily into that music at the time. And and so I'm just looking through and like click on this video and Dean Martin is hosting a roast of my dad and they're like pals. And like, I find this plaque from Sinatra. Like my mom just has it in our storage room, just like not even framed, like nothing. It's just like, give our love to Christian and Ariana. It's so nice to have you over. Love Frank and Barbara. I'm like, what the fuck? Like how famous were you? Then the answer was really famous, like really famous, like crazy famous. You don't really understand that, but I also didn't really understand how talented he was either until I started watching his old movies, Birdman of Alcatraz and Kelly's Heroes, and the list goes on and on and on. I think he's, I still think he's the best Bond villain. I'm heavily biased, but I still think he's the best Bond villain that's ever existed. And you just really can't appreciate it until you're an adult and also until you're, you know, kind of studying as a young artist yourself. You don't really get how talented people are. You take it for granted. And he never had a lesson. Damn it. I mean, just God, the amount of talent. You know, and it really just came from him having lived so many lives before he became an actor. He was he was 40 by the time he actually got his first major movie part. It didn't even start until he was about 37. He had lived, he was a lifeguard. He was a, a World War II veteran. He was a theater director. He was, you know, a radio host. Like he had had so many lives before he became an actor. I think at a certain point, he's like, well, nothing scares me. Fuck you. <laughs> do anything at this point slight left turn but kojak was such a huge tv show and loved by everyone who grew up watching it but what were some of the tv shows that you loved to watch growing up oh my god frazier <laughs> love that show i could watch it every day i used to watch a lot of friends i loved friends but i think my favorite show that ever existed was ally mcbeal ally mcbeal was i you could not talk to me on monday nights at eight o'clock, if you even like breathed in my direction, I would punch you in the face. If Ally McBeal was on, nothing else existed. You've just totally put a pin in your age mentioning those shows. Oh, 100%. Oh, no, I'm a thousand years old. No, listen, I'm America's favorite geriatric pop star, okay? This is just, I have no qualms about it. It's wonderful. But yes, I am a fucking ancient. It's ridiculous. Yeah, and I was obsessed. Robert Downey Jr., oh my, oh my God. The only thing I've ever bought from eBay, it wasn't even signed. Why did I even buy this on eBay? I bought a framed picture of Robert Downey Jr. Just like a black and white photo. Like it didn't even have his autograph on it. What film? From uh, Only You. See, I'm an OG. Like everyone loves to love Robert Downey Jr. now that he's Iron Man. He had a bad go of it with kind of getting into runs with the law and this and that. I stuck by that man, okay? This is like, you know, a lot of these people are Fairweather fans. They only loved him when he was back up doing $100 million movies. I'm like, where were you? Weird science. Less than zero. Less than zero. Oh my God. And James Spader. Jesus Christ. I mean, listen, between the two of them, I had a, a real soft spot for fast talking, hyper sexual, just kind of dark Dudes, like him and James Spader were my favorite actors. Favorite, favorite actors. I watched Boston Legal and all of his movies. Yeah, so between that and Alan McBeal, I just, yeah, I was obsessed. Have you ever seen the film Bad Influence with James Spader and Rob Lowe? No, I haven't. Got to do it. Uh, now I'm going to write it down. I thought I'd seen literally every James Spader movie. There's, I, my favorite are his really perverted movies like Secretary, Sex, Lies, and Videotape. He just plays such a great pervert. God so good. He's in tough turf, right? God, you're schooling me on, on my Spader knowledge. I've never seen that movie. You see, I love every Spader, though. I love, like, you know, young, pervy, always playing a drug addict Spader. I love bald Spader, blacklist Spader. There's not a bad Spader, man. They're all good Spaders. Every Spader is my favorite Spader, for sure. Pervy Spader, I love that. <laughs> Best Spader I've ever seen. <laughs> My boyfriend knows this too. He's like, God forbid you ever meet James Spader. And he wouldn't even blame me. I'm like, listen, can you blame me? He's like, how old is he now? I think he's in his 60s. I don't give a fuck. And you mentioned friends. Did you ever meet Jennifer Aniston? Because she's your dad's goddaughter, right? I actually just met her. And I am under a confidentiality agreement to tell you the context in which I met her. All I can say is that I was doing a project an undisclosed project, and happened to meet Jennifer for the first time since my dad's funeral. Obviously, I didn't know who she was, and I didn't even know if we met when I was seven, but that was the last time that we had ever even been in the same vicinity as each other, and she's the loveliest human being. I mean, if you're ever like, because God, you know, I've I had the good fortune of, of meeting a, a, a large handful of celebrities just because of who my dad was and, you know, just being in Hollywood. It's usually a very grossly disappointing experience. You know, people are just 
never as nice as you, you think they are. They're just, they can't be bothered or whatever. You know, I could tell you some stories that I don't want to come back to haunt me, but Jennifer is 100% ex- like ha- exactly how you would want her to be. Cause you know, God, I watched her in Friends, you know, since I was a kid and loved all of her movies since. She's so fucking talented, but she also just seems like a great person when you watch her on TV. She's cause she's one of the, there are two kinds of actors, right? They're the ones that you go to watch them disappear. Like people like Christian Bale. I have no idea what Christian Bale is like in real life. No idea. I don't even know what accent he has. Like, honestly, I have no idea what this human being is like because he literally just is like a chameleon and just disappears in every single role. And then there are the actors like Jennifer that you go to watch them and she's so brilliant because she obviously embodies all of the characters that she plays so well and she transforms in this really lovely way, but always keeps this like part of herself, this charm that she has. And it's so beautiful to watch that. And she kind of carries that through every role. My dad was the same way. You know, you really felt like you knew my dad when you watched him on TV. You know, I think Jennifer has that same, has that same charm. So, you know, when I met her, I didn't know whether that was just great acting or whether that was, you know, her. And, and I just, oh my God, what a sweet, sweet woman. It was so lovely to finally meet her. When your dad sadly passed in the 90s, you all moved to um, Minnesota. Do you remember much about that initial move? And do you know why Minnesota? Yeah. So when my dad passed, my mom is actually from Minnesota. She's from Duluth, Minnesota. I think that if we had grown up in LA, kids of a celebrity and kind of went down that path, you know, we we could have turned out fine, but we we could have turned out pretty fucked up. A lot of people I know kind of went down that road and, and, and it Ain't nothing but misery down that road. So, you know, so my mom took us out of Hollywood when we were kids and she just really wanted us to have a very Midwestern, able to play in your front yard without being worried about being kidnapped sort of life. It was honestly, I think the best thing she could have ever done for us. Who was it? Was it you and your brother? It was me and my brother. Yeah. Yeah. My brother is two years older than me. So we moved when we were seven and uh, eight, eight and 10. And it was just, it was the craziest culture change, you know, but it was the best. I love Minnesota. Have you ever been to the Midwest? I have, yeah. I did some shows over there and we went, we did a show in Minnesota, so it was lovely. Was that the first time you saw snow? Yes, yes. We were terrified. Like, what the hell is this? And it was also like the, it was the first snow in a hundred years that was like, it was breaking records for how cold it was. We're like, we wanted to murder our mother. It was ridiculous. So we're like, why the hell did you move us to this place? Like, it was negative 60 below zero Fahrenheit without wind chill so cold that people were throwing ice into the air and it was crystallizing midair. Wow. Insane. We hated her. That first winter was not not fun, but the rest of it was pretty nice. Did your surname bring much attention to you back when you was in Minnesota? Did it ever crop up or anything like that? It did for bullies. Right. I was heavily bullied when I was a kid. Yeah, that was back when bullying was still cool. Thank God these these new kids are wising up to that that not being a nice a nice thing to do. But back back in my day, (laughs) bullying was very cool. You know, all the hip kids were doing it and I was not a hip kid. So I was was heavily, heavily bullied. And, you know, kids were just fucking mean. They were mean. They just, they'd come up to me in the schoolyard and they'd hear my family didn't pay for my father's grave or some dumb shit like that, which was not true, obviously. And these newspapers don't care. Like a lot of these newspapers don't give a crap. If there's something that they can go off of and, and make some money, they, they will. But after my dad died, you know, there were a lot of beautiful memorials in magazines and, and newspapers, but there was also a lot of trash, right? And there was a lot of gossip. And it's really sad because, you know, kids don't go and read the National Enquirer on their own. So this is stuff that their parents are telling them when they're 12, right? They hear that the Savalas kid is at their school. Oh, I heard that insert whatever garbage gossip that they got from Star Magazine or whatever. And kids would just come up to me and go, I can't believe your family would, you know, do that. It didn't happen a lot. I was heavily bullied for for many other things besides my father, you know, that had nothing to do with that. But yeah, they would they would definitely bring him up. I remember the only time that I ever threatened physical violence against someone when I was a kid is because they said something horrible about my mother because my mother was so much younger than my father. They were married for 20 years. They were together for 20 years, longer than longer than most, I'd say, you know, up until the day he died. But people just, you know, they love to call her names and question the love that they, they had for each other just because she was so much younger. And so kids would try to say mean mean shit about my parents. And I, yeah, I, I almost punched this kid in the face <laughs> one time. But yeah, crazy that it would come up sometimes. But, you know, most kids were nice. It was, it was just for the bullies. Was music and performance something that always interested you, even as 
a young girl then? Was music super important all the time growing up? Oh, yeah. Uh, You know, it's funny, like, you know, when you grow up in a family like mine, you know, my mom was a painter and an inventor. My dad was obviously a brilliant artist. Uh, You know, my uncle was a brilliant musician, singer. My grandmother was a concert pianist, brilliant singer, songwriter, could sing circles around me. Jesus, she's so talented. So in my family, It was not normal to have a desk job. It was not normal to grow up and get your MBA and go be an accountant. Whenever I would say music is too much or I was overwhelmed, my mom would say, go get a real job, go be an actor, go be a singer, go dance, go do what you do. Like this is, you know, and this is just the world I grew up in. It was just, it was very normal to be surrounded by art. So since I was a very small kid, I was doing concerts and plays and musicals. I grew up in doing musicals studying Shakespeare, studying classical theater before I ever got into songwriting and burlesque. That was really what I grew up with. What was the first concert you attended then? First concert. Oh, first concert I ever went to was the Backstreet Boys. Yes. Oh my God. I died. (laughs) It was amazing. Who was your guy in the Backstreet Boys? Oh, so like I wanted to like Nick Carter. I thought that I was like, you know, I, I was going for the blonde and my mom's like, Kevin has so much more substance, baby. He's just got like, you know, he's got substance and sophistication behind those eyes. He's very tortured. I was like, you're right, mom. I'm going to go for Kevin. Um, <laughs> very funny. Yeah, I was obsessed. I still am obsessed with the Backstreet Boys and in sync. My first, first concert, though, was actually when I was like five. Peter Gabriel was my first concert. And I cried so hard because it was so loud that sadly my dad had to take me out of the concert. So I ruined it for him. But started a lifelong love of Peter Gabriel music. And of course, Ricky Martin. Superb. Still grieving his sexuality from when I was 13 years old. (laughs) Really thought we were going to get married. Like 100%. We were going to run away together. Am I right? You moved to London to study acting. Yeah. How was that whole experience? And how long was you over here for? Oh, God, not that long. I was supposed to come back to London. So I went to RADA. I was part of their Shakespeare program. They had like a program that was for a semester and get a certificate from RADA that was like a Shakespeare certificate. So when I was very young, like very young, I was still a teenager. And I was like, fuck high school. I want to go to London. <laughs> so I, I auditioned to get into this program and got into this program. And it was the first time I ever really did anything on my own. I went to London and studied for that semester. And then I planned on coming back to RADA to get my full college degree either there, or I also, I think, wanted to audition for Lambda. I just, I really wanted to be in London because I had grew, I'd grown up in London half of my life. When, when my father was still alive, we spent half of our life in London. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it was like a second home to me. It still is. Every time I go to London, I feel very much like a second home there. You know, so I really wanted to go back there to, you know, I was looking at a few schools here as well. But then life took me in a totally different direction. As it does. You think you're on your path. Oh, yeah. I got punched in the face with my path because, you know, I I graduated high school early because after I went to London and when I finished that semester, I was like, uh, middle finger to high school. I'm done. I just want to get the hell out of here. So however I can graduate earlier than possible is what I want to do. So... So I decided to graduate early, got all of my credits finished in one semester instead of two. So I didn't have to graduate with all of the rest of the people at my high school. (laughs) And I moved out to Los Angeles when I was like 18. I was a child. You know, I was studying acting at Jeff Goldblum's repertory theater, Playhouse West in Los Angeles under Robert Carnegie. And he's a brilliant acting teacher, still a very dear friend of mine. I was taking classes and applying for schools and, you know, doing everything to get ready to go back. Then I got cast in a movie. Randomly, somebody had heard about me through God knows what. And then I got an audition to play this supporting part in this movie, this true story about a Lithuanian Jewish woman who had survived the Holocaust because she looked very non-Jewish. So she was able to pass for a non-Jew. And so I auditioned for a supporting part. I didn't get it. And the director called me and he's like, are you a moron? What the hell were you thinking coming into my audition with, I had like some lace thing on. I was like supposed to be like a Holocaust survivor. I had like a tank top or some. He was like, that was the dumbest thing ever. You're coming back. But this time I want you to audition for the lead. And I was like, what? I thought you were just reading me the riot act. Please don't go try to find it. It's a very bad movie. I had never acted before. And you can get away with, you know, mediocre acting when it's a horror movie. You can kind of be a cult classic. But when it's a true story about a Holocaust survivor and you're being compared to the likes of Sophie's Choice, maybe it's best to have a few more years of experience 
under your fucking belt before taking on such a gravitas role. Did you enjoy it though? Did you enjoy the acting experience? It was brilliant. It, you know, it was a it was a life changing experience. I remember telling a friend of my father's because he worked with my dad a lot and he was kind of mentoring me at that time. And I told him when I got the part, I said, but I'm going to college, study musical theater. What the fuck am I doing? And he's like, listen, Ariana, you have your entire life to go back to college, which I did. And I didn't study acting. I studied law. But he said, you have your entire life to go and screw it up by not taking this opportunity. Don't be a moron. He said, do not let this go because people spend their entire life going to school and going to acting classes for this opportunity that for some ridiculous reason has literally fallen in your lap. You have been in LA one month and you've booked the lead part in an indie movie. Like this is unheard of. I was like, all right, well, I just have to trust because I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for any of it. I wasn't ready for the publicity around the movie. I wasn't, they, the reviewers were very, very kind to me, but you know, they trashed the movie and they kind of spared me their, their ridicule, I think, because they knew I was so young. But the whole acting world and I had met some, some people you know, that were extremely unkind. And, you know, the Me Too movement was not around when I was starting out when I was 19. And I really could have used it, right? Because it was fucking bad. I had directors calling me 25 times a day. When I say 25, I mean 25. Voicemails. What are you eating? Who are you having sex with? Who are you talking to? Do you have a boyfriend? What are you doing? Why are you eating this? I would have like literally on sets, the director come and slap food out of my hand when I was like eating at the craft services table. Like, I mean, you're not ready for that shit when you're a kid. You're just not ready for it. And I did a few movies and I remember just having a total nervous breakdown and going, fuck this, I'm out. If this is what Hollywood is like, I don't want any part of it. I'm gonna go be a lawyer. I don't care what the hell I need to do. I just need to get the hell away from this business because I hate it. Thank God I kind of came around and found kind people that changed my view of what the industry could be like, you know, some people who showed me kindness and, and weren't just taking meetings because they wanted to have sex with me. But that took a while. Quite the tumultuous exploration, I'd say. How did it all transition to put focus on becoming a singer-songwriter then? Was there a particular opportunity that came along? My entire life has been spent throwing shit at a wall and seeing what sticks, right? I mean, truly, if you really want to know the trajectory of my career has just been like, okay, this works. All right, I'm just going to go with that now. Because I loved everything, you know? I grew up acting. I grew up singing. I grew up in musical theater. So I love dancing. I love singing. I love acting. I love writing. I love writing music. I love playing piano. I loved all these things that were taking me in all these different directions, you know? So I was kind of just doing a mosh posh of stuff when I was in my early 20s. Didn't really know what the hell I was doing. And then one day I was introduced to the piano player for Billie Holiday. Her name is Corky Hale. And she's a brilliant piano player, a harpist, played with George Michael Bjork. She's just amazing. And her husband is Mike Stoller of Lieber and Stoller. Do you know Lieber and Stoller? They wrote all the Elvis songs, Stand By Me, Jailhouse Rock, You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog. It was funny because when I met him, he was such a cute little Kermit the Frog. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know his last name. So I just asked him, so what do you do? And he's like, oh, I'm a songwriter. I'm like, oh, that's so nice. And he I've ever heard of he's like probably and then I go to their house and their house is like 40 million dollars and I'm like what did you write like what the fuck did you write jailhouse rock he's like yeah actually she had been told by a friend of my family that I sing so I auditioned for her and she really loved what she heard and she said that she wanted to produce my first shows so I started performing as a cabaret performer doing one woman shows comedy and singing and a couple of original songs, but mostly Sinatra and Peggy Lee and Julie London style tunes and started building up a fan base for that and, and started playing in cabarets all over the country. These really high end, very fancy cabarets simultaneously writing music that did not fit that whatsoever. I've always been a rock and roller at heart, but this is what was getting me some semblance of success. So it was really kind of hard to kind of walk away from that and go play uh, piano and kind of rock out to Queen on the weekends. But eventually I found burlesque, right? Because And that was the marriage of those two worlds, right? So I had been introduced to Dave Cause, who's a, a brilliant saxophone player, a very dear friend of mine. He introduced me to the manager of Postmodern Jukebox, which is the band that I ended up you know, changed my whole life, right? So he came to one of my jazz shows 
And he said, hey, you should really uh, work with my band, BMJ. I'd never heard of them. I go online and I see um, they've got like millions of views on jazz songs. I'm like, what the fuck? This is insane. I've never, you know, because I, I was playing 50 seat theaters at that point. Barely. I was like, great. If I'm working for 200 bucks and a drink ticket, I'll, you know, I'll be thrilled. Then I flew to New York. I filmed my first video with them to put on their YouTube channel. And from there, little did I know, I mean, literally at that point, I was, like I told you, playing 50 seat theaters. And then the year after that, we were playing Radio City Music Hall. It was insanity. It's insanity how it happens. It's really crazy. So just from that introduction to Corky and then her producing my first jazz shows to then this guy coming to one of those shows and hearing me play. And then through Postmodern Jukebox is where I was able to really develop my burlesque acts and then incorporate my original music into burlesque, which is what my career looks like now, which is, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah. I mean, you kind of like seize that opening where everything you was doing, like you say, you like doing all different kind of things, but this kind of opening occurred where you could bring in the songwriting, the burlesque element, the vintage style musicianship, just to bring them all together. It's just seizing that opportunity. Yeah, it was amazing. I didn't really even know that burlesque was still a huge world at that point, you know, and I went to Paris and I saw the Crazy Horse and the Moulin Rouge and my life was just forever changed. I, I never went back to traditional jazz after that. I said, this is my opportunity to fuse these two worlds of rock music that I write and the vintage music that I've loved and grown up on. This is the opportunity to fuse those two worlds together. And I just, I really never looked back. It's really bonkers. Did you take classes? for burlesque or was there anybody in particular you were a fan of i guess the easy focus i would guess would be dita von Tees as she brought it more into the mainstream but what was your kind of introduction to it my first introduction i'd say was the candor and ebb musicals chicago cabaret baz lerman moulin rouge when i was a kid i watched these musicals and bob fossey's always been my number one inspiration i'm just obsessed with him and i remember watching those musicals and you know most people would watch those musicals if they're a performer and say i want to be on broadway someday and I said, I want to be the women in these musicals. I want to be Satine, without the prostitution, of course. But this is the world that I wanted to be in. But I didn't even know that world existed, honestly. And then I went to Paris, like I told you. And when I saw these Parisian cabarets and these Parisian burlesques, I just became obsessed. And the Crazy Horse was the real inspiration for everything I do. I mean, those women are such sensational dancers. And the artistry of what they do. I mean, it's really... Because, you know, burlesque is a very difficult art form, right? Because, you know, people are very quick to make, you know, funny little quips about stripping, but they have no idea how difficult it is and, and how much of a real job it, it actually is. If you're a good stripper, it is a fucking job. And it's a completely different art form from burlesque. But, you know, there's an interesting Venn diagram of where they kind of overlap and then where burlesque has to take on its own art form, right? Because if it's just how do I explain this? It's something that has to tell a real story, right? Whereas, you know, stripping is, is very heavily sensuality and, and sexuality and fantasy based. Burlesque has all of those components, but then also really has to tell a story. So for me, that was kind of what excited me about burlesque is, you know, as a songwriter, there's a lot of different avenues that you can take your music into, right? You can go and be Madonna and you can tell your stories through amazing choreo and fabulous sexual outfits. You can be a songwriter like Sarah Bareilles and Carol King at your piano. There's so many different avenues for, for expressing your music. For me, burlesque was that venue because I write very fucking dramatic songs and it was the place that I could be as dramatic as I wanted to be and as colorful as I wanted to be and as insane and sequiny and, and all of these miserable songs that I was writing because all of my songs if you take away the glamour of the production they're really depressing songs I'm really depressing I only and exclusively write about just terrible heartache and misery and it's just so much fun to be able to, to then transform that trauma and tragedy of all these broken hearts that you know have been left in my wake and transform them into something fabulous and beautiful and sexual and fun such a cool camp to have these songs and then to be able to put it into a video and then the live element as well but you also do like your own cover songs too just you and a piano i loved your brian adams and britney spears songs which you did they were great thank you that was born out of covid actually so you know obviously burlesque is an art form that you have to be you know forget six feet you got to be within six inches of your audience it's painfully intimate you can't just be up on stage you know 50 feet away and fuck off you really got to be interactive with your crowd and during covid uh, you know i didn't perform for a year and a half 
when I was quarantining at home, it's very funny because for a lot of people performing for hundreds of people, if not thousands in your, in your underwear is their worst nightmare. But for me, it's just a Saturday, right? So for me, I, I can do that all day long, 24 hours a day, but just sitting and playing songs at the piano is very, very nerve wracking for me. I don't get nervous. I'm a shameless human being, but the first time I did those strip shows during COVID because I just wanted to do something still for my audiences and keep playing and keep engaging. And so we just decided to do this strip series where it was just me and my piano in my studio. And I was terrified. <laughs> Look, I cannot tell you how scared. I would cry. I would like, I, my hands were sweating. Like I could not, I was freaking out because I just, I don't, I don't play piano for people. I really don't. It's not really my thing. You know, I write all my music on piano, but you know, if I play one song in my show, fine. But like, it's just a means to write for me. It's not, a, you know, I, I never felt at home just playing and singing. So it was just an ultimately terrifying experience, but it ended up being so much fun. We had, we had a great, great time and it was a wonderful way to keep performing during the pandemic. That was really, it was important to me. Kind of just to bring things to a close, we started off talking about Robbie Williams. We've touched on the Backstreet Boys. Is there a band you love growing up that you think should get more acknowledgement for having such great songs? Perhaps someone you'd like to shine a light on with a cover version? Or is this somebody you've perhaps covered with PMJ where you're like, wow, I didn't realise how amazing these songs were? God, you know, the, the first person who comes to my mind is actually a very dear friend of mine. His name is Spencer Day. He's been number one on Billboard. Certainly no no slouch. He's had a lot of wonderful successes in his career. But in my opinion, he should be up there with the likes of Michael Buble. Like he is one of the most genius songwriters I have ever heard in my life. I don't know if you know who Cole Porter is, who used to write It's All Right With Me and Anything Goes. He wrote Kiss Me Kate, the musical Kiss Me Kate. And like, oh, you know, he's just a brilliant, brilliant songwriter, singer, fun. And Spencer is really that person. He wrote some of the music on my last album, The Dead Dance. He wrote the song that goes to the Chateau Marmont and he co-wrote Venus de Milo with me. He's just one of the most brilliant people I've ever heard. And every time I hear him perform a new song, he's like, oh, I just, you know, I just wrote this song. I just wanted to play it for you, Hope. I'm sitting in the back going, I fucking quit. Fuck you. I just, there's just no, there's no competing with that level of, of artistry. He's just so good. So yeah, go, go check him out. Oh, and Curtis Steigers. Oh my God. Do you remember Curtis Steigers? I've had him on the podcast. Oh my God. Okay. Talk about fangirl. So like, again, nobody really understands. Like my mother used to play Curtis because she, she discovered him when we were living in London because he was very famous in the UK. He had a number one record and I wore out that record. I know every song, every fucking lyric, everything. Man, you're going to fall in love with, sleeping with the lights on. I wonder why. I can't. I'm obsessed. Obsessed. He's so talented. And I cannot tell you, I've met a lot of people, you know, I've had the great pleasure of meeting a lot of like of my idols in my life. But when Curtis Steigers added me on Instagram, I shit myself. <laughs> <laughs> like so excited. And I was like, I was writing on all of his stuff. I was like, I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> like, he's like, who is this like crazy stripper who keeps writing me? Like, what the fuck is she doing? It was really funny. You guys could collab super easy. Your stuff would like mold together. I'm working on it. We're going to make it happen. You know, he just has to lift the restraining order and we'll make it work. You know, and again, he's a person who's had amazing success. I just also feel like people should know more of him. He's just so talented. I know he's doing so much more like kind of jazz stuff. Like I knew him as a pop jazz with his first record. And then he got much more heavily kind of into the jazz scene. So when I was in the cabaret world, we were playing a lot of the same clubs. So I'd like see, I was like just missing him. Like all of a sudden, I was like, no, Curtis, he's here the week after me. Like I have to, I have to meet him. It'll happen someday. You're on his radar. You're on his radar. I know whenever he likes one of my Instagram posts, I like screenshot it to my mother and I send it. I'm like, look, Curtis liked my photo. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. I'm going to end it on that because I love it. I love some fangirling and some fanboying. Got to do it. <laughs> Ariane, it's been amazing to speak to you. Oh, likewise. It was so nice to meet you. Good luck with the new album when you get a name for it. Oh, God. Beyonce is the end of me. I'm so, I'm so happy for her. I'm so happy it was Beyonce. There's got to be some press mileage in that. Beyonce stole my album name. I think I'm just going to call it that. We'll just see if I get sued and I'll give her a cut. <laughs> she does, she needs the money, obviously. She's totally poor. Oh, for sure. Totally. 
Alrighty, been great to speak to you. You take care. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. What do you want to know? What do you want to know? Big, big thanks to Ariana Savalas for sharing so much fun stuff in this episode. And please make sure to go watch and listen to her new single, What Do You Want to Know? Which is out now and keep up to date with all future events in Ariana's world over at arianasavalas.com. Lots of things happening here in the world of Straight to Video too. We might just be releasing one episode of the podcast a week right now, but that does not mean we're slowing down. Quite the opposite. The Straight to Video 80s video shop will be opening soon. There's a bunch of touring opportunities on the cards, which are going to be great if they work out. And through that, I can spread the STV word a little more. But i got to thank all of you for the continued support, either through checking out episodes over at stvpod.com or if you've signed up to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash stvpod, I really appreciate each and every one of you. So, hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please check back next week for another talk, and until then, please take care and speak soon. <laughs>